Welcome to the France 24 debate, America's role in the world after four years of a foreign policy, which you could roughly sum up by America. First, a change is now expected. Almost immediately, the US president-elect Joe Biden signaled an imminent return to the Paris Climate Accord. That's the one that President Donald Trump pulled out of uh, almost as soon as he was elected. Will there be a similar move, for instance, on the Iran nuclear deal? Will there be a revision? perhaps, of the decision to cut financial support to the Gaza Strip. There are so many questions on so many different dossiers around the world. How will the Biden-Harris ticket recalibrate the global influence and presence of the United States? Let's take a look at this report before we meet our guests. Back in January, on a visit to Washington, Benjamin Netanyahu showered Donald Trump with gratitude. You've been the greatest friend that Israel has had in the White House. And I think tomorrow we can continue making history. This to a leader that made Israel one of America's top priorities abroad, recognizing Jerusalem as the country's capital, backing its settlements in the West Bank, supporting its claim over the Golan Heights, brokering normalized relations with the Arab world. Trump certainly left his mark on Israel. Trump completely flouted international law. For me, this will be the biggest change. As opposed to Trump, Biden will want to respect international law. With Joe Biden now elected as the US president, change may be on the horizon. As Barack Obama's vice president, he condemned Israeli settlements. And once he takes the reins, he's expected to open diplomatic doors to Palestinians that had been closed by Trump. He was also an advocate of the Iran nuclear deal, clinched in 2015. Under the agreement, Iran scaled back its nuclear program in return for lifted sanctions. Netanyahu calls it a capitulation. So Trump pulled out of the accord in 2018, a move Biden might try to reverse, worrying Israeli officials. We must ensure and demand that the United States, even if it were to return, enforces it and implements it, because we know that there have been grave um, um, gaps between what is reported by Iran and what actually happens on the ground. Among some Iranian officials, Biden's win sparked cautious optimism. There is still time for the U.S. to come back from the wrong route they've taken. We will closely be watching words and actions from the upcoming U.S. administration. Biden sees a return to the nuclear deal as just the first step before fresh negotiations. But one thing is clear. The president-elect, a self-described Zionist and friend to several Israeli prime ministers past and present, will not give up his country's close relationship with Israel. Indeed, if the uh, foreign policy was uh, termed as America first, uh, certainly uh, the one exception was uh, Israel. Let's then uh, bring in our guests to discuss uh, America and the world, where the uh, Biden-Harris uh, foreign policy uh, may uh, see the U.S. being recalibrated in terms of its presence and influence. Uh, joining us uh, by Skype from Canada, Besma Momani. Uh, Besma is a professor of political science at the University of uh, Waterloo. Besma, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, joining us by Skype from Paris, uh, Arthur Bronstein, uh, political advisor, uh, president of the International Forum for Peace, a former advisor to Yitzhak Rabin. And let me just explain to, to viewers, uh, in case they're wondering, uh, people joining us, of course, by Skype. Uh, we're on lockdown in France. We don't have guests in the studio, uh, which is a shame because it's nice to have people around the table. However, needs must, and this is how we are operating. So good evening to you, Arthur. Good evening to you, Besma. I hope you can hear us. And we're really keen to hear what you have to say on the situation. Arthur, can I bring you in first, if you don't mind? Um, you and I have spoken about the Middle East on many occasions. Um, I'm wondering what you are expecting in terms of a change of attitude from Biden and Harris as opposed to Donald Trump. Allow me, please, to remind us all that today <clears throat> disappeared a very important friend and the most important Palestinian negotiator, the Secretary General of the PLO, uh, Mr. Saeb Barakat. And uh, I spoke to Saeb a month ago, and he was expecting a lot from the, from the upcoming election in the state. He was hoping that Biden will win, and he, he saw uh, in, in, in the victory of Biden 
a possibility for the Israeli and the Palestinian to renew uh, direct uh, negotiation and for the American to play a more fair role than the one that the former uh, administration wa was playing. So for me, it's a very sad day. I'm losing a friend and I'm losing a partner for peace. And uh, I do believe that what he wanted uh, in our last call will become a reality. I do think that the uh, Biden administration will be uh, more, uh, will have an attitude towards the uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace uh, process more, uh, more balanced, uh, more open. Um, and I think that we know the position of Biden on this issue. We know the position of his uh, vice president elected, uh, Mrs. Harris. And uh, we all hope that the new American administration will do whatever it can, uh, they can and they should do, is to push Israeli and Palestinian to come back to the table of negotiation. I do believe that it's a, you know, we're all uh, happy about the election of, uh, of Biden because I do believe that it will bring a little bit more serenity, uh, more calm to the international debate. And uh, Biden, uh, in the opposition of, uh, of Donald Trump, I believe, is more concerned by the international community. He didn't want to, he, he won't isolate United States of America, as it was the case in the last four years, he will go back, I believe, to the COP21 when it came to environment. He will go back to the deal with uh, the Iranian, with some changes, I believe. But I believe that he will do uh, whatever it takes to, to go back to the table of negotiation with Iran. And he will push Israel and Palestinian to go back to the table of, uh, of negotiation. Indeed, Offer, I think it's a good move. Yeah. Offer, thank you very much indeed for those opening remarks. Uh, Besma, can I bring you on on, on, on a similar issue? Uh, w what are you seeing uh, as, as the change that Biden and Harris can bring to uh, US foreign policy? Well, I think a lot. I mean, certainly a tone. I mean, everybody's going to be relieved in the tone, obviously, a bombastic one that came from from the Trump presidency. But, you know, at the same time, you know, Trump was very transactional. Um, he was, frankly, if you were able to get on his good side, he uh, really went to bat for you. And I think there are going to be a lot of leaders around the world who will miss him. I, I know it sounds hard for us to imagine and believe, uh, but I think that's the case for a lot of leaders. And it will be a surprising list of leaders, frankly. It's not all the, the regular subject, su suspects that you would think. Could you name um, some names? I think names? also we're going to see a different... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Modi, for sure, from India. Uh, we can see Taiwan's leader will very much miss, I think, Trump, who's been really hard on China in many ways. Uh, certainly Netanyahu has had a very good relationship with Trump. Note to, uh, to self to all the others that, you know, he still has his picture with with Trump uh, on his on his uh, Twitter feed. I mean, certainly that really says a lot, uh, even though that he's no longer clearly president-elect. Um, that obviously is one person. So, so as well, Bolsonaro from Brazil, AMLO from Mexico, I mean, Hungary, uh, Orban, uh, Duda in Poland. There's a number of leaders, I think, who will miss Trump because he was beneficial to them. Uh, certainly, if you wanted arms, many of the Arab Gulf countries will miss him because he was very happy to provide arms uh, at, frankly, very little uh, uh, sort of regulatory check in terms of human rights violations and the rest. So there's going to be leaders who will miss him. But I think the world and the people, not to say the people in those countries will miss him, because a lot of people will be definitely, uh, you know, breathing a sigh of relief. Indeed, security deal announced with the UAE. That was uh, rubber stamped by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo uh, just uh, earlier. And certainly those issues you're talking about, Basma, very much uh, present. Uh, Offer, can I bring you back in to, to ask about the things that... Uh, it's just... <laughs> I'm, I'm told we've just lost off a bronze note. That's the way uh, live television uh, happens. Let's go back to uh, Besma, who I hope is still with us. Uh, Besma, please tell me you are there. It would be great to continue our conversation. I was, going I, to, I was going to ask Offa what he felt about the possibility of things being rolled back. I mean, clearly moving an embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which was extremely controversial. I don't think that's probably going to actually be moved back, mm -hmm. is it? Um, the issues regarding, say, for instance, the Iran nuclear deal, something that Donald Trump described as an awful deal, a terrible deal, and he pulled out of unilaterally. Um, I'm wondering myself whether there'll be any kind of uh, rollback on that one, whether Biden-Harris will want to sort of return to that one or renegotiate a different one. What, what, what do you think? I mean, on the embassy, I don't think it's going to be returned. Uh, you know, remember here, Biden is very pro-Israel. I don't think that we can, you know, sugarcoat the reality that Although there was a very tense relationship between Netanyahu and Obama, uh, Biden, Biden has always had a very good relationship with the Israelis and with Netanyahu, generally speaking. Um, that's not going to be reversed. And frankly, I'm sure 
Uh, there may be some elements of the progressive party of the Democrats who'd want to see that reverse, but the major majority of the Senate will be Republican, and I think there's just no appetite to do something like reversing the embassy decision. Uh, on the JCPOA, I think there is definitely going to be an interest to go back to some sort of multilateral negotiations, which the JCPOA was. The challenge, of course, is that the world isn't the same as it was when it was negotiated in 2015. Remember, the beauty of the JCPOA was that you were able to get European countries were very much in cohesive lockstep on this issue. Uh, you had uh, certainly China, uh, you know, willing to be a part of this tri this multilateral exercise, the Russians. And the world is a very different place. We've had the invasion of Crimea. We've had, obviously, a huge trade war uh, with the Chinese. So it's going to be very difficult to get a multilateral framework back on the table. And also, I'll just quickly add, that Iran has changed. Iran has gotten more hardline. And we know that there's a June election coming up. We know that the hardliners have gotten stronger basically blaming Rouhani, the moderate, for all of the economic challenges that it's faced. And so it's going to be a very difficult, different world uh, that Biden faces in trying to re re reinvigorate this JCPOA. Indeed. Many, many issues at home to, to cover. Many, many issues abroad too. Basma, thank you very much indeed. Arthur Bronstein is now back with us, I'm pleased to announce. Uh, offer, of course, political advisor, president of the International Forum for Peace, former advisor to Yitzhak Rabin, offer. Um, can I ask you, uh, what your feelings are about the, the issue we were just talking about, the, the JCPOA, uh, the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, clearly it's something that um, Benjamin Netanyahu was very keen uh, to get the US uh, to renounce. And um, one, one, one can only imagine the conversations between Netanyahu and Trump on that issue that led to Donald Trump making that decision. Let's not, for, let's not forget, and I disagree a little bit with you, the previous uh, uh, guest, uh, that the relationship of Biden with Netanyahu were not always very good ones. Uh, Biden is having a bitter taste of the last visit than he did in Israel as vice uh, president, uh, while at the same time that he was in his way to meet Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, this one declared that we are going to build a few hundred uh, housing in the, in the, in the settlements. And uh, Biden's response was that he arrived uh, with two, three hours uh, delay to, to, the, to the gathering with, uh, with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, uh, the the Democrats don't forget as well uh, the personal involvement of Prime Minister Netanyahu in the American election and the speech that he went to do, uh, went to make in the Congress while uh, Obama was uh, still president and Biden vice president against uh, the deal with, uh, with um, Iran. Which the, Democrat, <clears throat> which the Democrat took very badly. So I do believe that the attitude that Biden and, uh, and Vice President Harris will have toward uh, Israel and towards, toward Israel, they are friends of Israel, it's established, we know it, and they will still be friends of Israel, as they always were. But when it came to the peace process, when it came to the international community, when it came to international agreement sign, they will have a different kind of attitude. First of all, they will have, they will listen to their partner. They will become again partners, uh, which uh, the, the former administration uh, did not foresee the European as partner. Uh, Donald Trump did everything possible for Great Britain to leave the EU, uh, which I think uh, some of them regret today. Uh, he was against the EU. He threatened to leave uh, uh, NATO even. So I do believe that uh, uh, with uh, uh, pra President Biden, uh, the American uh, will uh, continue increasing their support in NATO. They will renew a better and more calm relationship with Europe, which is needed. They will go back, as Biden promised, and Harris as well, uh, to, the, to the Paris Protocol on Environment, uh, the COP21. And I do believe that they will do the best they can uh, to bring back the Iranian to the table of negotiation on new terms. Uh, Arthur Bronstein, I need to cut you off there. I'm sorry. Time is against us. Uh, that's part one. Stay with us. More to yeah. come in part two of the uh, France 24 debate. Welcome back to the France 24 debate. We're discussing America's role in the world after four years of foreign policy, which could best be summed up as uh, America first. Uh, now we're expecting a real change uh, from the uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris uh, ticket. Or well, what kind of things will they be addressing 
Uh, will there be a move, uh, for instance, on the Iran nuclear deal? Uh, will there be a revision of, say, for instance, the decision to cut the funding of the uh, Gaza Strip? Uh, we've already heard from Joe Biden that he's considering an immediate return uh, to the Paris uh, Climate Accords, something that's been applauded uh, here in France uh, and beyond. Uh, let's bring in our guests who will be discussing this with us. We're joined by Arthur Bronstein, who is a political advisor, uh, president of the International Forum for Peace and former advisor to Yitzhak Rabin. Arthur, thank you for remaining with us. Pleasure to have you on board as ever. Joining us from Brussels, Dave Keating, uh, France 24's uh, Brussels uh, correspondent. Uh, Dave, of course, here to lend us uh, his take on the situation regarding the US, the EU and beyond. Dave, thanks for being with us. And Elizabeth Braw joins us, Senior Associate at the European Leadership Network, which is a non-partisan think tank. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. And I'll, I'll come to you first. Uh, Elizabeth, the change uh, that we were talking about in part one uh, could be a big one, going from Donald Trump and his approach to Joe Biden and what he might uh, seek to achieve. Where do you think he may turn his view first. <laughs> Where do you start? It's uh, it's uh, virtually every policy area is, is open uh, or up for grabs or open to change. But I think uh, you mentioned the climate, and and as we all know, Joe Biden has promised to join, uh, rejoin the Paris uh, climate agreement on on day one. Uh, but China is, of course, the the most. Uh, uh, well, in addition to the climate, uh, the most urgent issue facing America. So how do you deal as America? How do you deal with a, a, a competing superpower that doesn't compete with you in the traditional way through uh, through armed forces, but through their uh, economy and through their global presence and uh, both through infrastructure and through their companies expanding internationally and indeed through um, their investments in, in companies in, in the West as well, including in, in America. So it's a very, China's a very tricky issue because, of course, globalization means uh, trading between countries. But if another country uh, exploits the openness of the West, including the openness of America, that's something that needs to be addressed. And Biden, it, it, one should point out, we should point out, has been as critical as Donald Trump of China. So there is, there is uh, no uh, change in sight, I think, in, in the, in the uh, fundamental approach to China. He may uh, conduct his policy a little bit differently in, in tone, but he is uh, as concerned about China as, as Trump is. Indeed, I was going to say, uh, Biden will have a pressure to, to maintain a certain, uh, a certain tone on China in order to, I, I think, placate and uh, basically uh, make, make happy uh, those people in, say, the Midwest, the people who maybe would be more geared towards voting Republican, concerned about their jobs, concerned about their livelihoods. He'll be needing to keep those people happy in what he says and does on China. That's right. And as we know, globalization has meant an enormous loss of jobs, uh, working uh, class jobs, not just in America, but elsewhere as well. So he, for, for that reason alone, Biden would have to, to be tough on China. But as far as we can tell, uh, he uh, also has a... Uh, I shouldn't say he has a problem. He 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 sees uh, what China is trying to do, not just uh, um, by competing with lower prices and what we can, we in the West, including America, what we can compete with, but, uh, for example, intellectual property theft, um, strategic acquisitions where Chinese companies buy up cutting-edge companies in our countries, including the US, that can be beneficial to China, and then they are lost to our countries. That is a, a, a really difficult um uh, or a problem to deal with because you can't just cut off all investment. So, uh, but it is a, 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 a really big challenge that he will have to deal with. And, and he, before being elected, he uh, several times made clear that he will be tough on China. And he even made the point that he will meet with uh, the Dalai Lama, unlike uh, Trump, who hasn't met with him. And meeting, meeting with the, the Dalai Lama means you will really... Uh, uh, enrage the Chinese leadership and they are likely to punish you. But on the other hand, if you don't dare to, to meet with whoever you want to meet with, uh, what is your independence about? Indeed, there could be fireworks ahead. And that, that reminds me, fireworks, in fact, invented long ago in China, weren't they? Uh, Elizabeth, thank you very much indeed. Please stay with us. Let's bring in Dave Keating. Uh, Dave, of course, our Brussels correspondent. Uh, Donald Trump, Dave, causing, uh, obviously, ructions between the EU uh, and the US. Um, also, the issue with uh, the UK. Uh, Brexit, Brexit obviously happening, uh, the issue regarding what's going to happen 
uh, regarding the uh, the border between uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. There are a number of very tricky issues uh, which Joe Biden now has to negotiate. But do you feel um, instinctively that there will be a very different way that Biden and Harris will approach the EU? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that is really the, the main certainty here, that the relationship is going to be greatly changed. The question is by how much. Uh, today, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen was addressing uh, ambassadors speaking at length on this subject, and she cautioned that while she knows People are excited about a Biden victory, and there's a lot of talk about reinvigorating uh, the transatlantic relationship. Things are not going to just go back to how they were before. She cautioned that there are a lot of reasons that predate Trump uh, for America kind of going in one way and Europe going in another way. Uh, and what she proposed today was a kind of new transatlantic relationship that recognizes those differences. And those differences are myriad. They're differences on trade. They're differences on how China is viewed, as you guys were just talking about. Um, there's differences on climate. I mean, I think uh, when we're talking about climate change, obviously that will be one of the big differences, that Europe will again have a partner to work with in America. Donald Trump turned away from any kind of climate action and was take it, took the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement. But of course, uh, people have to be realistic here. Joe Biden is not against the U.S.'s shale gas boom. He's not against fracking. He is certainly going to be looking to export U.S. liquefied petroleum gas LPG to Europe. Uh, so Europeans may be in for some disappointment if they think that Joe Biden is a European in American clothes. He is not. Uh, he is also going to be looking out for America's interests. I think that European politicians know this. They're excited for uh, at least for all the chaos and uncertainty of the last four years to be over. But they're, they know that the relationship is difficult for reasons that are larger than Donald Trump. Indeed. And one issue with Joe Biden is very sharp is uh, one that concerns his Irish roots, uh, the uh, future of the uh, Irish border. Uh, of course, the issue is Brexit, uh, an issue you've covered extensively for us, Dave. Uh, I mean, clearly for, for Boris Johnson, the, the UK Prime Minister, uh, achieving his ambition of taking the UK out of Europe is one thing. Uh, but clearly, one of the things he wanted to do was put together a trade deal with the US in order to uh, create uh, a, a, another market that he could say to the British people, look, this is the great deal we've got you coming out of the uh, enslavement we had with the European Union, was how I think Boris Johnson might have put it. Uh, Biden being very clear, anything that touches uh, the Good Friday Agreement, anything that threatens uh, the Irish border, and threatens the peace in Northern Ireland, no way, this isn't going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it was very interesting that the Irish Prime Minister, Michael Martin, was the first European leader to congratulate Joe Biden. That wasn't lost on anyone. And even in those first, in that first hour after the result was called on Saturday, there were questions about whether Boris Johnson was going to recognize Biden's victory, given that uh, he's kind of hardwired himself to Donald Trump in terms of Brexit. Uh, so much so that I noticed on the American networks when Johnson made that endorsement, it was considered a big thing. Everyone referred to him as a, a Trump ally. And he has, I mean, Brexiteers are now trying to walk this back. Uh, they're saying, oh, no, we never said that a US, UK FDA was necessary to have no deal with the EU. But that's not exactly what they were saying before. They were really hoping for a speedy FTA with the US and that Donald Trump, since he's uh, said he's such a fan of Brexit, would get them that. Of course, that wasn't really recognizing reality, that Donald Trump was never going to be able to get that for them all on his own. It would have had to pass a Democratic Congress. And House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is equally uh, angry with the UK about violating the Withdrawal Act uh, and possibly reestablishing a hard border in Ireland. Pelosi has spoken out against that. Joe Biden has spoken out against that. The people around him have been even more uh, forthright about how displeased they are with the UK and not impressed by Brexit, they are. So I think the, the end result of this is it does mean that it's going to be more difficult for Boris Johnson to plow ahead with a no deal and that he's going to have to make some significant compromises in the next week or two in order to avoid that no deal scenario and get a deal with the EU. It's not a position he would have wanted to be in. Of course, it would have been in his short term political interest for Donald Trump to win re-election uh, just because at least they would have had that maybe 
mirage that the U.S. could have bailed out the U.K. from a no-deal Brexit. Uh, but now they've lost that, and I think it, it, will, it does make a deal more likely, but it definitely doesn't make it certain. Indeed, the echoes I'm hearing are no deal Brexit and uh, friends of Boris Johnson in the city set to make lots of money on the back of it. That's the echo I'm hearing anyway. And I think it's easy to, to forget, Dave, um, what the, the issue was like, which led up to the Good Friday Agreement, of course, the, the, the troubles, as they called it, that period when people were being killed, uh, when bombs were going off, when the IRA was, for instance, uh, uh, blowing up uh, targets on, on the uh, English mainland. Um, you know, it's easy to forget all that now, but um, this is the kind of what some people fear might happen again. And obviously most people say it won't happen again, but there's that doubt there. And anything that sort of raises a doubt about what happens uh, to that piece in, uh, in Ireland clearly needs to be clamped down upon. So uh, Biden-Harris uh, with clear tasks ahead there. Dave, thank you very much indeed. Do stay with us. Let's go back to Offa Bronstein, who's uh, uh, basically, whose who's remit is, is really, I think, more Middle East. Uh, but Offa, I know you've got opinions on all aspects of what happens uh, regarding the Biden-Harris uh, foreign policy outlook. From what you've just heard here, do you feel uh, that we're moving towards uh, a world where there would be more negotiation and more kind of smoothing of things? Or do you think that the inevitability of what we've had over the past four years and the way the world is going will mean that there will still be these flashpoints, these points where people cannot negotiate and where maybe force is, 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 has to be used? First of all, I do believe that the priority for the new elected president and the vice president would be the internal problems. They are uh, the American United States is uh, in the middle of a terrible, terrible uh, uh, health crisis, a very difficult economical crisis. So I believe that that will be his priority. And we saw it yesterday. The first team that he, he built was a team that will have to deal with the coronavirus. Um, but I think that on the international uh, arena, the big differences between uh, between the former president and the new elected president will be that Donald Trump wanted to build walls. He wanted to saw the United States as being an island. He wanted to build walls all over. And I think that Joe Biden is going to uh, build bridges. Uh, he doesn't want to, uh, would, would like to be a part of the international community, part of international and respect international agreement, and not as uh, Donald Trump. I think when they, you know, in French, you said, il y a la parole, il y a la, il y a la musique. Uh, you have the music and you have the word. Uh, with Donald Trump, we did not know, we did not really understand the word, and the music was not very uh, uh, nice to, to listen to. With uh, Joe Biden and, 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 and Kamala Harris, I think that we will uh, like better the word, and we will like better the music. Uh, it's time to negotiate, it's time to talk. I do uh, totally agree with uh, your guest, and it's not going to be easy with China. It's not going to be easy with Russia. Uh, different uh, 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 issues are only will be on his desk and will be difficult to, to deal with. But at the same time, he's uh, well known and well respected as being a very good negotiator, very patient, very kind man, and that will be an asset for him uh, to try and to bridge the gap, not only with uh, Asia and China, but with the Russian as well. And again, when it comes to the peace process in the, in the Middle East, I do believe that he will have the skills uh, and, uh, and the power, if needed, uh, to push Israel and Palestinian to go back to the table of negotiation. And let me uh, remind you, uh, Kamala Harris, as well as Joe Biden, always were for the two-state solution, which was not very clear during the uh, Trump uh, administration. Now it's very clear, and I think that we will uh, push Israel and the Palestinian in this direction. I do believe that we will do it with the international community. Uh, from what uh, the conversation I'm having in the last couple of days with some American friends, I do think that they will ask the European, maybe mainly the French, which is in my interest, uh, to be more involved and to play a better role, as it was in the past in uh, Madrid, uh, in Madrid conference in '91, and uh, during all the peace process between Israel and Palestinians, the European always had a role to play, not an only economical one but a political one, and that may help Joe Biden to go forward as well. So I'm, 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 I'm sorry, as we all are, but uh, his main concern will be the problem at home now. Resolving things in, uh, in the internal, in the internal electorate, the internal uh, the market, getting things right at home first. So in a sense, America first, but with a very different feel complete. Offer, thank you very much indeed. This idea that the United States has kind of withdrawn 
uh, from the world stage, leaving a vacuum for uh, certain other countries to move into, uh, was something we were kind of talking about uh, earlier uh, in our programming uh, with uh, Richard Kirigostin, who's director of the Regional Study Center in uh, Armenia. Uh, Richard, of course, joined us to talk uh, earlier about the truce between Azerbaijan and Armenia over Nagorno-Karabakh. Richard had this to say about what he's hoping for uh, from Biden and Harris. Well, personally, as a Democrat, I welcome this change as long overdue, not just for the South Caucasus, but internationally. What we do expect from an incoming Biden administration is simply to maintain their commitment. A number of earlier statements have already indicated the Biden administration's commitment to democratic Armenia. We are hoping as well that the U.S. can work with Russia within the Minsk group with the assistance of France, to actually stabilize a post-conflict scenario, looking at security the day after this agreement. Richard Giragossian talking a little earlier from uh, Yerevan. Uh, one of the issues regarding his particular story, of course, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, is the, the rise of Turkey uh, being a player behind uh, Azerbaijan, Turkey expanding its ambitions uh, across uh, the Middle East, across uh, North Africa, involved in areas where perhaps Otherwise, you'd have expected to have found perhaps the United States playing uh, a greater role to try to keep peace, uh, to try to calm the situation, but now absent, of course, because of uh, Donald Trump's policies of the past uh, four years. Uh, that vacuum, I'm wondering whether now that vacuum is going to be filled. Uh, what do you think, uh, Elizabeth Braw? Well... I think uh, it's it's obvious from European reactions and indeed global reactions from from America's um, allies and, and friends and and even some neutral countries uh, or countries are, are between between the U.S. And, and and other powers that there is a great deal of hope that America will play that that um, uh, global. Uh, role of a judge again. I'm not going to say policeman because nobody likes a. Well, I shouldn't say nobody, but but uh, the, the term policeman has has negative connotations for many. But many countries uh, do want America to play a, a, a more active role again. I think we didn't realize how much uh, we needed America until Trump retreated or, or took America with him from the global stage. And as a result, we have these situations where uh, not just in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, but elsewhere as well, for example, Libya, where Turkey and, and Russia have been able to assert themselves. And America has been uh, rather passive, Not and, and, and we shouldn't uh, forget the Arctic as well. Turkey is not in the Arctic, but Russia is in, in China. And so we need America to come back. And I think that's why everybody is, uh, or so many people, so many leaders are relieved that, that, uh, uh, that we have had this change now, because whatever we think of America, it's, it's not a healthy situation. Uh, to have where Russia and, and, and Turkey are, are the, and, and China are the, the, the dominant voices. Um, so it's, it, it was to, to be expected what then happened, which was that virtually every European leader and many others uh, read the sigh of, of relief, when, relief when, when Biden was elected. Indeed. Elizabeth, thank you very much indeed. Dave Keating, I'll come to you. Brussels, of course, where you are, uh, capital of the EU, you could say, but it's also home to NATO. And Donald Trump was very uh, disparaging uh, regarding NATO and regarding uh, how much the United States uh, was paying and calling on the other NATO nations to pay more. Uh, perhaps he had a point, uh, perhaps he didn't. Uh, but certainly America's role within NATO has been vital and would continue to be vital, uh, perhaps uh, under a different president. Are we expecting a different relationship? I think certainly, I mean, we had uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg be one of the leaders who very quickly congratulated Joe Biden, noted that Biden has been very um, committed to the transatlantic alliance. But again, this is one of the areas where it has to be pointed out that the disagreements between the U.S. and the EU predated Donald Trump. It's just that Donald Trump stated them more loudly. The Obama administration had the same complaint uh, to EU countries about them not meeting the 2% of GDP target that they committed to in 2014. Uh, and earlier than that, actually, and Robert Gates came to uh, Europe and delivered a really fiery speech that uh, didn't get a lot of attention at the time, but he really, really laid into European leaders uh, for not spending on their militaries. Uh, Donald Trump came in and he just 
accelerated that hugely. Um, the big line that he crossed was that he would not uh, affirm that the United States would defend European countries if they were invaded, even before he was elected. The question was put to him, if the Baltic states were invaded by Russia, would the US intervene? And he replied, well, it depends if they've paid their dues to NATO, uh, implying that uh, the US would, you know, the US's military protectorate guarantee over Europe was not a cast iron guarantee. It would depend on the mood of the president and whether people paid in. Some serious questions have been asked about European defense in the last four years, whether NATO is really suited for the 21st century, whether it's actually just a relic of the Cold War. Uh, the EU has started building a European defense union that would eventually enable Europe to be able to defend itself and not rely on American help. Uh, right now, Europe isn't capable of self-defense. It needs the United States. And it would take many years to build up a European military cooperation that would be capable of defending this continent without American help. The fear of the people who have been advocating for EU military self-reliance is that uh, this Biden win will make Europeans sit back and say, okay, everything's fine now. We don't need to worry about this anymore. Uh, let's not pursue this European Defense Union plan. Uh, let's just go back to relying on NATO. That's not really what the United States wants. Uh, the United States wants Europe to be more self-reliant and not have to be uh, paying so much into the NATO budget. Uh, but you know, we'll see how Europeans react to that change. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said that he's spoken to President-elect Joe Biden uh, about working together on tackling climate change and recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this being said, of course, as ever via social media, as everything is these days, he says he looks forward to strengthening the partnership between uh, our countries, the UK, the US, and to working with him on our shared priorities from tackling climate change to promoting democracy and building back better from the pandemic. Uh, no talk about the trade deal, which, of course, uh, Johnson's been touting uh, ad nauseum since uh, the whole... Uh, issue of Brexit uh, came about, and uh, we're still waiting to see how that will uh, shake out. Uh, thank you very much to our guests, uh, Dave Keating in Brussels, to Elizabeth Braw uh, from the uh, European Leadership Network, uh, Offa Bronstein of the International Forum for Peace, and uh, from part one, Besma Momani uh, joining us uh, from Canada, uh, from the University of Waterloo. Thanks to you for watching too. Stay with us, more to come here, live from Paris.